Well, liberals are pretty stupid, and uh, I've made videos like this before, and so are lots of other people, but I can only read and see so much before uh, I have to say something uh, about it again, even though I probably already have. Um, I've been watching the last couple weeks uh, the new HBO show, uh, The Newsroom, with Jeff Daniels. Uh, and it is an entertaining show, but it's by Aaron Sorkin, who, uh, he's had a long career, I'm not that familiar with it, uh, but he's probably most famous, at least in television, I know he's done a few movies also, for uh, The West Wing. And I remember I never watched The West Wing that often, but uh, I had friends who did it, and I did see a number of episodes. And it's clear that he would try and be fair. There are a couple episodes and there are a couple times where he gives um, Republicans uh, a chance to talk about what they believe and why they believe it, but mostly it's liberals and it's mostly what they believe and it's from their point of view and it's Sorkin's point of view. And in the newsroom you get a couple segments where you're pretty sure that what the characters are saying is actually a monologue by Sorkin or somebody else, possibly, about what they believe. And uh, it's comically absurd what a lot of them believe. And I didn't make a video about that because uh, I didn't want to make a video just about an HBO show, unless it was Game of Thrones. But uh, just this morning I read an article, which as it turns out is almost a year old now, but it's by somebody who is a former member of the GOP, and he's basically bashing the GOP and how insane they are. And I agree. I mean, I don't. I hate the GOP. They're terrible. And and he points out a lot of the things that they're terrible at, like the Patriot Act and and their aggressive foreign policy, which of course I agree with. Now he says, well, Democrats do that too, but not as bad. Um, I don't see any distinction. They do it just as bad, and Obama, in a lot of ways, has done it worse than Bush ever did. Uh, but it, one of the themes that they both come up with, and this is this is one of, one of the many fundamental misapprehensions that liberals have, is that they acknowledge that there are problems in governments. That there, there are very few, almost no political commentators out there who are just who just will say, even though I think there's some who might feel this way, but who, who will admit that everything in government's fine. That they'll, there are obviously problems in the way the government operates. But where they diverge is why they think there's a problem. And in the article I read, and also in Aaron Sorkin's uh, newsroom, and I've heard it many, many, many other times, the refrain is, the problem with government isn't government per se, it's the corruption of government by um, lobbying, by corporate sponsorship and donations. And uh, the article I read, and I'll, I'll, I'll post a link to it just in case anyone's interested, uh, he said, yeah, Republicans are just, they're just there for the rich donors. Now, I, I don't see uh, how that's different from the Democrats. I see them as being pretty... Uh, you know, willing to take and wheel and deal in that way also, but I think this is a fundamentally absurd position to take, that the problems with government stem from it being influenced by uh, money. Uh, let's, as an analogy, let's just say we have um, a local uh, neighborhood. Like, I, I grew up in a neighborhood, I live in a neighborhood. Say you have a neighborhood, it could be in a city, it could be in the country, whatever. We have a whole bunch of people living there. Everyone's getting along fine. And then we go to one person in that neighborhood. And we say that one person has the power, the powers of government over the people who live in that neighborhood. So they can legislate. They can pass laws. They can tax. They can take money from anybody that they want to whatever degree that they want. Anyone who tries to avoid that or, or get away, they can be punished, uh, they can set regulations, they can tell you what you can and what you can't do, uh, what color your house is, when you get up to work, where you work, how much you work for, if you disagree, if you try and 
Um, you can talk to them. You can you can try and convince them to do it another way. But uh, if they decide, then that's how they decide, and you have to follow it, or else you'll get punished. And if you ever have a dispute, what well, with somebody, like just another another neighbor, this guy will be the judge. Which if he's a judge to two other parties, then meh, hypothetically. He could be unbiased, although there's a huge incentive for him to maybe reward his friends and hurt his enemies. But what if we have a dispute with him? Well, he would be the judge in that case also. So if you think that his regulations are too stringent and you go and say, yes, I, don't, I really don't think that you should force me to buy health insurance, um, he would say, well, let me think if I have the right to do that. I think that I do. So I win the court case. I, I'm the arbiter. I'm the judge. Uh, and then let's say because he has all this power, some of your neighbors start going to him and saying, listen, uh, I want you to not regulate me in this particular way. Here's money. So they basically bribe him to not use the powers he has against them. In that scenario, would, we, would it make any sense to say the problem and the only problem here, the only thing that's wrong with this society, this mini society, although it could be as large as you want, is that some of your neighbors are bribing basically the government the person who has the institutional powers of the state would that make any sense no the fact that they have those powers is where all the corruption and malinvestment and terrible things stems from it's the power that they derive from that that's bad and the fact that some people try and assuage that power or use it to their own effect uh, is perfectly rational, re rational and reasonable from their point of view. And absent the governmental power of this one person, there'd be no reason to bribe them. There'd be no one to bribe. There'd be no way to get around it. And so uh, government is not just corrupted by money. Government is corrupted by the very nature of its institution. The newsroom, uh, at one point, he gives basically the, the the story is about an anchor who becomes um, fed up with how uh, inane news coverage is, which is a hundred percent, well, not a hundred percent, but mostly correct. News coverage is pretty inane; it covers all kinds of things that are are pretty silly. But his response is that uh, he's going to only talk about things that. Uh, will help democracy, basically, that will inform voters, you know. And he gives a big monologue, and he says, back in the 20s when, you know, when TV was basically regulated, uh, the government made one big mistake. They went to the big networks, and they said, you have an oligopoly, you know, three, three networks. They said, you get the bandwidths, and uh, you can profit off them. But you have to do a uh, an hour of news every night in prime time, uh, which is a uh, simplification of how actually the news comes from. It is not. Everyone will notice on the major networks they all have news every night, you know, at a certain time, and one might wonder why exactly that is is that a law that says they have to do that actually no there isn't exactly that but what happened was the government gave a monopoly to these corporations and said okay you can profit off these and in return you have to do something you have to do something public spirited and that's pretty innocuous that's a very vague hard to define thing and so they established the FCC to basically ensure that they do this and the FCC's regulations could or could not mean anything. What what has kind of developed is an understanding that if we do X, Y, and Z, then the FCC is placated and thinks that we're doing enough. And X, Y, and Z means in a half hour of local news and a half hour of national news every night. And uh, also that that news cannot be, uh, it, it must be moderate. So you cannot have Rush Limbaugh to use an example of somebody I really don't like, but you cannot have Rush Limbaugh be on prime time on the main networks because the FCC would be like, that's not fair. So there's a default uh, moderation slash um, uh, pro-government stance, at the very least because 
anything that's overtly strongly anti-government would be con uh, condemned by the FCC as uh, too radical and, and not mainstream and, and they could be subject to fines which they can pay but they could also hypothetically although I don't think it's ever happened lose their monopoly which of course that's it and that's a long story short but the Jeff Daniels character in the newsroom gets it a hundred percent wrong because he says if they just mandated that you not allow any advertising during that time period then the news would be unbiased and they wouldn't care about ratings and everything would be better wrong the entire networks income and their entire business plan is based on the government granting them a monopoly so they wouldn't suddenly become unbiased about the world maybe they'd be unbiased about their advertisers but they're still going to be biased in favor of the government because the government has granted them a monopoly and how can it, this is so absurd how can you have the pretense of informing an, uh, an electorate for democracy if you are biased in favor of the government you know these these d democrat pimps these democracy pimps i think they would have the intellectual honesty in most cases if you said well shouldn't people have a fair view of the government and what it's doing they say of course they should of course they should well how can they have that aaron sorkin in this particular case if the news media is beholden to the government for its entire well-being. They can't. Uh, and that is a fundamental, that's a, good, that's a good example of the blind side here. That, oh, all this evil bad stuff, it derives from corporations donating and people donating and, and think tanks donating. They usually don't say things that they like, like unions, but uh, it's all an evil corruption of, of uh, special interest in government would be just fine if we could somehow minimize that. No, government would not be just fine. Not that you can minimize it, but even if you could, government would not be just fine. Um, another good example from the newsroom, uh, they have a, an anchor who, do, who does little segments, not the main character, who is an economist. And they don't really, I haven't seen, they haven't actually shown what she says on television, but she has a lot of discussions with the, the crew. And one of the producers of the show uh, goes to her and says, I don't know anything about economics. Would you be willing to, you know, basically give me the, the basics so I have some idea what's going on? Now, when she asks her to tell her this, and they, they show their meeting where they, the, where they discuss this, does the economist, does she talk about monetary policy or the Fed, or does she ha like even talk about any of the schools? Does she talk about Milton Friedman? She certainly doesn't talk about the Austrians. But she doesn't even mention uh, John Maynard Keynes or the Federal Reserve or the Treasury or anything like that. The one thing that she thinks you need to know about the economy, and this, I really get the sense that this is Aaron Sorkin or whoever the writer is, but I think it's Aaron Sorkin speaking through the characters. The one thing you need to know about the economy is a Glass Steagall and the culture of deregulation. That is, and and the 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 economist explicitly says has been rampant since Reagan, and they even go on to say how Bill Clinton repealed Glass Steagall, and this is kind of presented as evidence that free market deregulatory fundamentalism is so strong that even a good president, good uh, president like Bill Clinton, succumbed to its uh, evil, like it's almost the ring of power. This is such poppycock. Uh, I mean, for that to be the one thing that you even mention is totally ridiculous. It would be far more likely and sensible for them even to bring up Keynes uh, and say, okay, let's talk about that. But no, it's Glass-Steagall. And, and the uh, economist woman who is, I think, really speaking the words of, uh, of a liberal, of Aaron Sorkin, says, they passed Glass-Steagall in 1934. And then we won World War II, we went to the moon, and we had, you know, the longest growth of the middle class, like, ever. Uh, so, hence Glass-Steagall is good. Uh, totally correlation causation, as if, as if before Glass-Steagall was passed, we didn't have prosperity. Like, we didn't have Glass-Steagall all through the end of the 19th century, or the beginning of the 19th century, or any of the 17th century, or the first 
third of the of the twentieth century. And well, was there no middle class? Was there no economic development? No, absolutely not. We went from a, an agrarian society to the most uh, wealthy society in the history of the world without Glass Steagall. All right. The stuff that happened since Glass-Siegel, it's pretty hard to argue that that is causal. I've never heard anybody, including Paul Krugman, ever say that Glass-Siegel allowed us to win World War II. Never mind the fact that World War II was a huge dis disaster in every conceivable way. Even if, even though we won, it was a disaster for us and for everyone. Uh, I never heard anyone say that... Uh, this, yeah, Glass-Steagall allowed us to go to the moon, or that's the reason the economy, but according to this person, according to the liberal, that's the reason. That's what happened. And uh, its repeal in 1999 caused a financial collapse in 2008. Uh, and of course, the absurd claim that we have been having deregulation, it is true that people like Ronald Reagan especially rhetorically talk that way. I think Ronald Reagan actually believed that, but Ronald Reagan was in over his head, to be quite honest. I think that he, I'm not making excuses for the man, but I think that he was kind of a old guy, and I've heard this from people who were a little bit more on the inside, not that I know them personally, but just in their writings, that it was really kind of George Bush Sr.'s presidency, and that, you know, Reagan would say, well, I kind of want to get back to a gold standard, and they would be like, Listen, Ron, like that just isn't going to work, so here. Uh, there was no deregulation in the Reagan years. The only substantive actual deregulation that has ever occurred in the United States is in immediate post-war periods, especially after World War I and World War II. During the wars, there is enormous regulations, total socialized, non-market economy, centrally planned, almost to the T. I mean, like literally to tea and sugar and meat and gas. And after the war, regulations were largely slashed, although not to the pre-war levels. But, you know, there's a big difference between the number of regulations in 1945 and the number in 1946 or 7 or 8. Those are the only times, those two literally are the only times where there has actually been on net deregulation. The only other person who's done any, and then since then, every once in a while, you might get one or two things deregulated, but hundreds of others more regulated and so that's not deregulation if you increase the number of regulations by a hundred and then you unregulate one thing you haven't decreased regulation you've increased regulation the president who did the most deregulation the most substantive was not reagan it was not bush it was not clinton it was jimmy carter jimmy carter did actually deregulate a number of industries like the phone industry, the airline industry, and a couple others. Now, he also introduced a lot, especially in the EPA. That's when the EPA started to get a lot teethier, although I think it might have predated Carter. I'm not sure. Um, but even he on that was a regulator. Reagan, rhetorically, yes, but he didn't deregulate. Bush didn't deregulate. They added thousands and thousands of pages. And liberals just have this mythology of, you know, that there is massive deregulation occurring when there isn't. And then they attribute that as causal to uh, the financial crisis in 2008. Even if there had been deregulation, there would still be the causation correlation fallacy. Even if George Bush had been Ron Paul and started cutting things here and there to the extent that was possible, it wouldn't be for sure that that's what caused the financial crisis. But as it happened, George Bush wasn't a deregulator. He was a massive, massive interventionist. Did he go around spouting that? Not too explicitly, although he believed himself, he called himself a compassionate conservative, which is to say he favors basically big government programs. Now, in the article that I read, uh, he basically was criticizing uh, the GOP for good things, you know, like it's correct to criticize them about their their bloodlust and their nationalism and, and that, and to the extent that they're bigots in social conservative areas, which is less and less true, but it's still kind of true, and that's, obviously I have mixed feelings about that because, you know, like what, gay marriage, why should the government be involved in marriage at all, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I'm, I believe in the right of association and the right of disassociation, and so uh, bigotry doesn't 
typically mean anything to me. I, I think that's fine. People have a right to be that way. And a mature person should not care uh, what other people do. If they, if they, Especially if you have a low opinion of them. Like, if Ron Paul did something, I might care. But if just some bigot did something, I, I wouldn't give a shit. And I shouldn't give a shit. But uh, but then they he went on to attack the the only things that might be considered good about Republicans, which is not I mean they they don't actually do. And here's the other thing is they mis attribute things that Republicans don't do. So he went on and on and on about how Republicans are basically a cult of Ayn Rand. Now I'm not an objectivist, and I'm not a huge Ayn Rand fan. I I respect Ayn Rand. I think she was you know, super intelligent, and she made lots of contribute contributions to libertarianism generally, although what she was really talking about was, I think, its own thing that just had libertar very libertarian characteristics, but, you know, it is kind of a, a separate thing that, you know, they, they still relate, but uh, I have never, ever in my life on live TV or on any speech or in anything ever heard a Republican cite or even mention Ayn Rand. I have on very, very rare occasions read one or two Republicans mention her in a vague way. All right? That does not constitute the GOP being a cult of Ayn Rand. Ayn Rand is like the left's favorite... Um, effigy to burn when they talk about free market economics and libertarianism and conservatism also. They build up a huge straw man that is Ayn Rand. They don't, A, they don't understand Ayn Rand, but B, they attribute people to having learned from her when they haven't. Uh, the one I'm, I see specifically cited all the time is Paul Ryan, but Paul Ryan does not strike me as somebody who is implementing an objectivist platform. If he really was, then he would be advocating things about a thousand times more, like literally a thousand times more radical than what he is talking about. Uh, if he was really an objectivist, then the policies he would be trying to bring about would be totally alien to what he's trying to bring about now. Uh, and it's just absurd to say a few references here and there mean it's a cult. Democrats, much more common than Republicans cite Rand, will cite Thomas Jefferson. They'll say, oh, Jefferson this, Jefferson that. That doesn't mean that Democrats are in a cult of Thomas Jefferson. In fact, their political positions are basically antithetical to everything. That, I mean, literally, that there might not be a single thing that Jefferson advocated or agreed with that the Democratic Party advocates and agrees with. But Democrats do sometimes say Thomas Jefferson, he was a genius and he had a lot of great quotes and they love to use them out of context. That doesn't put them in a call to Thomas Jefferson. Really the only politician I know who I've seen who has referenced Ayn Rand has been Barack Obama and it's always been in a derogatory, stupid way like, oh, uh, you know, government should run everything. Uh, and I ran it, doesn't know what she's talking about. I remember he said we need to, uh, something about, there's no virtue to selflessness or something. He, he like quoted one of her book titles, I think. So this is, to me, is an enormous straw man. And it's, it, it's disingenuous to Republicans because they don't believe it, but it's also disingenuous to, uh, to Ayn Rand and, and objectivists because what they want is not being implemented in any way by Republicans. Uh, and it's just this fairy tale land, and, and like, Ayn Rand is has is being supplanted right now. She basically has been supplanted in terms of her ideological influence on libertarianism and the right generally. Ron Paul and the Austro libertarians that he represents and promotes very explicitly uh, are rhetorically taking over the Libertarian Party and. To the extent that that has influence on the broader conservative movement, that also. I wouldn't call it a takeover. I'd say it's an ideological influence. That is evident in the Tea Party, which is not to say the Tea Party is great or anything, but there is there is rhetoric that is coming from an Austro-Libertarian position. 
not from an Ayn Rand position. And anybody who knows about libertarianism, or conservatism even, even like the people of the American conservative know this. Pat Buchanan knows this. People like Bill Kristol, who's not, you know, he's a neoconservative. He knows this too. Liberals don't know this. To them, it's Ayn Rand, Milton Friedman, maybe F.A. Hayek. They kind of all lump together. There's no distinction between the two. And uh, they all probably think that The Road to Serfdom is some kind of evil hate book. Uh, the fact that, I mean, and we all, I mean, if you ever get into debates, you always get these comebacks. I never, I've never had anybody come back at me with an attack on Rothbard or Mises uh, or uh, Bastiat or Menger or Bob Bobberg, certainly. Uh, I'll get Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, Ayn Rand, maybe Adam Smith, maybe F.A. Hayek, and maybe Milton Friedman. But that's it. It doesn't matter what, and and the rhetoric that I use and the rhetoric that a lot of people use is going to be explicitly Austro-Libertarian. It's going to be Rothbardian, probably, at the very least Misesian, and anybody who knows anything about Libertarianism would be able to recognize that. But liberals don't recognize that. They just see an evil cult of child-hating deregulators. Uh... Both the article and uh, and uh, the newsroom, Aaron Sorkin, who I think is a very is a very representative liberal, expressed disgust at the Tea Party. They expressed disgust at politicians who are partisan. Uh, basically, the ideal here is that government should be governing. Government should be out there cranking out laws, cracking down on people, uh, just that, that legislative and executive power should be exercised to the fullest. And I hate to tell them this, but it more or less is Tea Party or not. Uh, but accepting the premise that that's good and that obstructing that through partisanship, say through filibustering or voting no all the time, that that's bad, that's assuming that you, the government needs to be acting this way. But there's a strain of thought out here that is apparently way over the heads of a lot of liberals that the government is enormously destructive to our society in general and in innumerable specific cases, in which case obfuscating it somehow, you know, monkeying up its gears, slowing it down is always good. I remember when the Congress in 2010 got elected. And uh, Gary Johnson was on TV, and I, I think it was on John Stossel. I could be wrong. And he said, well, what do you think? Do you think this new Congress is going to, like, you know, undo a lot of regulations and repeal a lot of bad laws? And Johnson said, no, I, I highly doubt that because of the Democratic Senate and the president. But there will be gridlock, and that's a good thing. This Congress will probably not pass the laws that Obama would want passed. We won't get another Obamacare or anything, and that's good. Now... That's perfectly rational to me. That makes perfect sense to me. That's that's a logical conclusion to come to if the government is destructive to society and, and is acting in a destructive way. But to... And it's interesting, too, because Johnson is not socially conservative. He's an atheist. You know, it's coming from a guy who's been elected by a lot of Democrats. But a liberal hears that, and all they hear is this person wants to destroy society. Government is the fountainhead a wellspring of all that is good and wonderful in society. It is the creator of wealth and beneficence. And to turn it off is to suffocate society and to um, retard it. You know, it's like not watering a plant or shutting out sunlight. No, that is such uh, statheist wor worship of, uh, of a fallible human institution that it's... Uh, it's actually comical that people who consider themselves rational and intelligent would entertain such absurd ideas. But they do en masse. Uh, and they can't understand, mostly because they live in a, a fake mythology, uh, that some people are against that and they would oppose that and, uh, you know, wish for its... Not, if not its downfall, at the very least, its retardation. So, 
uh, in the newsroom, they, they do a part where they cover the elections in 2010, like they're reporting it. And, and they're all upset because all these good Republicans, all these establishment Republicans uh, are getting kicked out and replaced by radicals like Mike Lee. They mention him by name. They don't. They mention Rand Paul in other contexts later. Uh, and uh, at one point he interviews a congressman who I believe is, is a make-believe congress. I don't think they, they named that for someone else. Who, uh, you know, 20, 10 term Republican congressman and there he's like, well, you got a lot of laws passed and you did a lot, you did a lot of handshaking and you did a lot of bipartisan stuff. And, uh, it's just too bad. You're a great service to this country. And it's too bad. You got defeated by some guy who wants to, uh, not vote up the dead ceiling. Uh, basically that the tea party is an evil radical organization. Also it's a Charles and David Koch conspiracy, which is another favorite uh, liberal uh, misapprehension that everything out there is from the Kochs. Like, I'm a libertarian, and it's because of the Kochs. I work for the Kochs. Everyone who opposes the government works for the Kochs. It's their secret cahoots, uh, and they use their money and, and, and influence to uh, saddle the government to attack their rivals, and Scott Walker is their pawn, and and uh, it's just, it's just. I mean, I bet the Cokes wish they had that kind of power, but the truth is that they don't. And uh, the left has plenty of people on their side, like George Soros and who knows how many other people, Goldman Sachs, who support them too. So uh, the idea that the Tea Party is too radical, and he says that in the newsroom explicitly. They're they're just they're getting radical radicalized, and it's 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 uh, it's going to destroy my party. And the in the show, ostensibly, the news anchor is a Republican, you know. And he said, "Oh, these these Tea Party people are ruining my party." Well, your party has sucked forever. The Republican Party has been terrible forever, and the fact that there's maybe a little bit. Of radicalism, some of which is good, of course, some of which is bad. I mean, you have those Alan West type characters who are just rabid, warmongering idiots. But some of that radicalism isn't so bad. And to be revolted by that for the status quo, I mean, this is the other thing I don't understand about liberals. They'll bitch and bitch and bitch and be like, society's not right, society's not right, society's not right. And then when someone advocates, okay, well, let's change the status quo, let's have radical change. No, no, you can't have radical change. Now, Granted, that the type of radical change is important. So, I mean, I wouldn't want a radical change to Marxist-Leninism. That would be radical change, and that wouldn't make it correct. But then to categorically just reject something because it's radical, that, that's a logical fallacy, and it's absurd. You need to analyze whether or not a, a particular uh, program or policy is going to be effective uh, and not just dismiss it because it's, quote, radical. That's just a way to dismiss things you don't want to hear. So, uh, and then the other thing, kind of tying it in recent events, this whole shooting thing, uh, liberals really haven't cared that much about gun control uh, in quite a while, actually. It's not a priority for them. But it is very interesting the degree to which they can have um, vitriol and they can... Uh, you know, hate this this shooting and how evil that is in the NRA. I mean, the NRA is kind of another one of those organizations which uh, they believe has this is kind of this could be a whole other video. But there's 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 a conspiracy theory out there that the only reason there's lots of guns in the United States and the only reason is because of the gun lobby, so called. And that there's a there's kind of a, a, a vicious triangle. You know how there is the slave trade that was called the triangle trade, where there's there's a trade where the NRA makes guns legal, and then the gun companies that produce guns get wealthy, and then the gun companies give money to the NRA, which uses the money to make guns more legal, which then increases the now of course that's missing one thing. There's no way for the NRA to make people buy guns. So even if guns are legal, that doesn't make, like, when the assault weapon, weapons ban expired in 2004, I wanted to buy a gun, but I couldn't because I didn't have the money. And 
Like, it didn't make people buy guns, but this whole thing is absurd. The NRA is powerful because there's millions and millions of gun owners who care enough about it that they donate money to the NRA regularly. Many of them are actually members, and there's many more who aren't members but are still supportive to the point of being financially supportive. And there's many even more, tens of millions of Americans, who patronize people who build guns, who buy Remingtons and Rugers and Smith and Westons and Colts and all, you know, Glocks, Berettas, all, all the Benellis, Winchesters, all the guns that you can imagine, there are people who buy them because they value them. And that's why the gun lobby is powerful. It's for democratic reasons because tens of millions of people care about that and they care about it more than just to vote. They, they, they'll vote for it too, but they'll care enough about it to give money, to buy things with it. And so the NRA isn't producing gun culture. It is the recipient the beneficiary of an existent gun culture. Now, maybe there's a little reciprocity there. Maybe it's, there's a reciprocal relationship, but it's not an evil lobby that is... And, and I see no correlation with them being able to repeal a regulation, which is very rare. I mean, the assault weapons ban wasn't repealed, it just sunsetted. That's the only thing that has changed in terms of types of weapons you can buy that I know about. There's been lots of reductions in where you can carry. The, the most important change has been that more and more states are letting people carry guns, and they're letting them carry them with less and less restriction. That's been really the only major development that's happened in the United States in the last 20 years. Uh, but yeah, liberals think that the, the NRA is, is that they like to kill people and whatever, and then Obama gets a free pass when he actually is literally murdering people, innocent people, with drone strikes and war generally. Uh, not to mention things like Fast and Furious, where they're just giving guns to, to drug cartels, killing hundreds of Mexicans in the process. Not to say that those Mexicans wouldn't have been killed anyway, but, you know, why make it all that easier? And, of course, the Border Patrol agent. Uh... But that's okay, because he's, he's Obama, he's a liberal, he's free-thinking, enlightened, and uh, he gets a pass. Even though there's no, there's no blood at all on the NRA's hands, but uh, the federal government is drenched in it, and like, uh, like a, a depiction of the devil in the, at the bottom of seven circles of hell, uh, Obama is sitting there right there in the middle. And now, yeah, Bush was sitting there right there in the middle, too, before. Uh, but Obama's kind of up the ante in pretty much every conceivable way in that regard. So, uh, absolutely absurd bloodlust. And then, whenever you, you, you talk to liberals, I, I've seen lots of videos, and I've, I've talked to liberals, whenever you start bringing up, like, the wars and all that, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I don't care, I'm just not interested in that. And, and then they're basically, they're, they're not admitting it, but they're, they're just saying, I have ignorance about that. Which is funny from people who like to go around pretending like they're the most sophisticated, well-informed group on the planet. When then their when their retort is, "I don't really care about that anymore. Foreign policy doesn't interest me," as one liberal told me once. It just doesn't interest me anymore. They're killing people, but you know, as long as he gives out welfare, you know, he's he's fine by my book. The liberals are fine by my book. They can do whatever they want overseas and even here. And, and then, of course, there's the whole drug war thing where they all say that they're, uh, you know, against it, but then he's waging it full scale, which is the real cause. If you really want to wonder why the crime, why there's so much homicide in the United States, the number one reason, it's not the only reason, but the number, number one reason is the war on drugs. It's so obvious. No other, no, I mean, if your goal is to have good policy, and if, if you're worried about the number of homicides in the United States, then trigger locks and background checks and any kind of gun regulation you might imagine will not have an effect or will have a negative effect. But abandoning the war on drugs, or at least partially abandoning the war on drugs, if you, if you just want to, say, legalize marijuana as opposed to everything, that would be a step up. Uh, that would have a pretty dramatic effect. I would argue a very dramatic effect, uh, much more so than any 
kind of increase in government power. But that's the thing is, liberals believe, first and foremost, in government power. And so that is what they advocate, even when clearly that's not the best idea. Uh, and it just pisses me off, and uh, I don't see any... I mean, these people need to be viscerally... They, they can't be reasoned with in most cases. They just have to... Something bad has to happen to them. They have to see a cop kill somebody and then walk, walk away without anything happening to them. Uh, you know they need to they need to be hurt in a in a way that affects them emotionally because that's their primary decision making tool, despite all their rhetoric to the contrary.